Am I on? Yeah, there I am. Good morning. Good morning. It's so good to be with all of you today. It is my honor as always when I get to share God's word with each one of you. And so um, just welcome this morning. Today what we're going to do is we're going to continue on in our study in the book of Mark. The book of Mark. We're going to pick up right where we left off last week. You know, as I was praying and seeking the Lord this week, I was just kind of overwhelmed and reminded about so many of the things that I love about being here. Do you guys ever feel that way sometimes? You know, I'm just overwhelmed with the calling that God has placed on my life and my family's life and just reflecting on that as well as the opportunity that I get to serve along each and side, each and every one of you that are here this morning. And so here at Fellowship Pickering, that's why we exist. We exist to connect people to Jesus and to one another. That's what we're here for. And, you know, I kind of get an inside look of what that looks like on a daily basis. And so let me just share with you, in, in my opinion, what that looks like, okay? It looks like this. We are for you. We are for you. We are for your growth in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are for your family. We are for your place in the kingdom of God. And that's why so often you hear us talk about these things all the time. It's why we always talk to you about serving inside and outside the, the church. It's why we talk so much about discipleship. It's why we talk so much about life groups and membership. It's because we want, we desire to see you living the abundant life that God has for you. And so I'm just going to go ahead again, and I'm going to invite you to the membership class at the end of the month. Whether you're here this morning and you're currently a member who just desires to renew your membership here at Fellowship Pickering, or whether you're here this morning and you've never joined in a covenant membership relationship here before, or whether you're just interested and curious about what we're all about, we invite all of you. We invite all of you. And so at the information table, there is a, uh, whatever they're called, iPad. And you can go there this morning at the end of the service and sign up for the membership. We are for you here. But here's the thing. Not everyone is going to be for you. We're going to see from today's text the truth in that. There are going to be opposition in your life as a result of the gospel and as you try to live it out. It's going to come from people who love you, and it's going to come from people who don't. I read a story this week about a young practicing lawyer in the 1800s. Uh, he, he would often write and attack his opponents through the local newspaper, through a series of uh, editorials underneath a pseudonym so they wouldn't know who he was. One day, however, a man, he ridiculed a man by the name of James Shields. Mr. Shields was not very happy about the editorial. And so he went and he tracked down this young attorney who had publicly embarrassed him, and he demanded for him to retract his words. The young attorney refused to do so. And so Mr. Shields challenged him to a duel. It was still legal back then. So this young man, he, this young attorney, he wasn't much of a fighter. He was an attorney after all. And, but he was given the choice. He was given the choice of which weapon to use. And so he thought, I'm pretty tall, pretty long armed. I'm going to choose swords. And so he chose swords for the duel, using his long arms, hopefully, as an advantage. He trained and trained. And on the appointed day, he met Mr. Shields on a sandbar near the Mississippi River. As the two men faced each other, the young lawyer swung the sword high above Mr. Shields' head and chopped through a, a branch that was nearby. Uh, Mr. Shields kind of took note at the, the length and the immensity of the reach of this young attorney and the strength that it took to cut through the branch, and it was enough to show him that he was at a fatal disadvantage. Luckily, there were bystanders there who were able to talk the two men 
into a truce. The young lawyer returned to his practice, humbled by all the things that had happened and occurred, and he never again publicly criticized anyone. The young man's name was Abraham Lincoln, who we all know ended up becoming the president. You know, it's easy, I think, sometimes to criticize people, to criticize others, especially in today's day and age where we can do that without the fear of consequences, without the fear of confrontation. It's often done maybe not even face to face. And in this life, you and I are going to face criticism. It's going to come from people sometimes that we know and love. But beyond the words of critical people, there's another who doesn't want you to succeed, who doesn't want you to change, who revels in your feeling bad about yourself, who wants to constantly see you relive hurts and disappointments in your past, who wants you to always be worrying about tomorrow, who wants you to continually dwell on all the things that are wrong with you and all the things that are wrong with this world, who scoffs at your dreams, who insinuates that you'll never have and you'll never be enough, who longs to see you constantly distracted, confused, and obsessed with anything and everything outside of yourself. Because he knows that if he can succeed in those things, that you and I are going to miss the truth. We're going to miss God. In today's text, the criticizers call him Beelzebul. Jesus refers to him in a parable as the strong man. And you and I know him as our enemy, Satan. The Apostle John says this about him in John 10.10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. So let's look at that this morning. If you have a copy of God's Word, you can turn with me to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 3. And we're going to begin at verse 20. Last week, Matt was preaching about the calling of the 12 disciples, and we discovered how our own calling is tied to that, that we're also called as ministers of the gospel under the authority of the Holy Spirit of God. And so Jesus calls these men to follow him. And then right after, look what happens. Mark 3, verses 20 to 21 says this. Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, For they were saying, he is out of his mind. (laughs) Even his own family suspected Jesus was crazy. That might surprise you this morning. Maybe you you don't understand, maybe you've never seen before that Jesus' family didn't believe in him. But there are actually accounts throughout the Gospels of members of his family not believing that Jesus was who he was. You know, I, I think the Lord, that when the Lord does something extraordinary in our lives, when he does something that's a little bit different from normal, when he reaches in and he changes someone forever, when he, when he saves us and makes us new, when he calls us to a higher calling in our lives, whatever it may look like, people who do not believe the way that we believe are not going to understand. I've had the privilege of serving the Lord here on the east end of Canada for the last almost eight years. And in that time, I've seen lots of different things. But one thing I've seen is that when God reaches in and he pulls a man or a woman from the enemy, when he pulls them from the bondage of sin in this world and he makes them new, often family who do not believe the same way are the ones that makes life the new life more difficult, that new, wa- that new walk of faith so difficult. I remember very, very well the, the first young man who gave his life to Christ through our ministry in Ottawa. Uh, I remember sitting with him and 
talking to him, and he gave his life to Christ, and he was so excited, and, and he just wanted to live a life that he had never imagined before. He felt such freedom from sin, and, and he had such a hunger for the things of God. And after he was saved, and, and we baptized him, and he was learning about who God was and this new life that he had, I remember one holiday weekend, I was spending some time with some other people from the church, and I received a phone call from this young husband and father. And he was at his extended family's for, the, for a meal and for time together over the holiday weekend. And he was sharing with them, with them what God had done in his life. And he was telling them about all the changes that were happening. And he was telling me on the phone, he said, they think I'm crazy. He said, they actually told me they think that I'm in a cult. And as I was talking to him over the phone, I could tell and I could feel just in his life, he was so defeated because he was so excited to tell them about what God was doing in his life in a way that was new. And he wanted to share that life-changing news with them, but they just didn't understand. Families can be hard sometimes, especially when there are differences in belief systems. And Jesus experiences the same thing that you and I experience in that way. His family doesn't believe. And so they think Jesus has lost his mind. And they're going out to try to, as the, the word says, seize him. I could picture them saying, we got to try to talk some sense into this guy. What is he doing? Those are his first critics. The people that love him, his family. Let's keep reading. There are parallel accounts of this story that we're about to read in Matthew chapter 12 and Luke 11, and they go in a little bit more detail than Mark does. What Mark doesn't tell us here before we get into this next section is that there was a demon-possessed man who was both blind and mute, and he had an encounter with Jesus Christ, and Jesus healed him completely. And so people were marveled and astonished and surprised and left speechless about what they saw and what they heard. Verse 22, and the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he cast out the demons. So the news of what Jesus had done gets all the way to Jerusalem. And of course the religious people feel it's their place to make the long trek from Jerusalem to Capernaum to investigate all the things that they had heard. And when they get there, they accuse Jesus of two things. The first thing they accuse him of is being possessed by Beelzebul. Jesus' family thought he was crazy, but his critics thought much, much worse. The former vice president of the United States and self-proclaimed inventor of the Internet, Al Gore, he once said this, when you have the facts on your side, argue the facts. When the law is on your side, argue the law. When you have neither, holler. I think that's a southern word, holler. A lot of people are doing a lot of hollering, aren't they? The scribes have neither the law nor the facts in their favor. And so they decide instead they're just going to simply accuse Jesus of being possessed by Satan. That's the first thing they do. The second thing that they accuse him of is driving out demons by the power of the prince of demons. Again, Satan. What's their strategy? They want to discredit Jesus. See, the thing is, they can't deny that he's casting out demons. Everyone can see that that's what's happening. But what they can do is try to cast some doubt on where the source of his power comes from. You know, I think so often people are willing to believe lies. Believe lies about themselves and others and other things. I think it's sometimes it's because it's a little more comfortable to believe a lie than it is to believe the truth. Social media, I think, has really been a tool that the enemy has used in a lot of ways in that people will simply, and you know what I'm, you know this is right, people will simply read and see something 
and without looking at the validity of what it says, they will believe it. And it absolutely baffles me. But the truth is, even Christians believe lies about themselves. I read an article this week that gave the top destructive lies that Christian believes, and I just want to share some of those with you this morning, because maybe you can see yourself in some of these. One of the lies that a Christian believes is this, I can do it on my own. So often we believe that. You know, we we try sometimes to live disconnected from people, or sometimes we try and carry our own burdens and we do it alone. But that's not the way that God's designed it. His word says that we are to cast our cares on him for his burdens are light. His word tells us that if we're alone, we can be overpowered, but two of us can defend ourselves. And when there are three, it cannot easily be broken. Another lie that we believe so often is I'm not qualified or God can't use someone like me. Matt spoke about this last week. It's where we exalt others and discount ourselves. We think in our lives we've gone too far. But God's word is filled with story after story of people just like you and me that he's used. And this room is full of people who have stories about how God has used them despite what they once were. And what they've done in their lives. It's not true. Another lie we believe is to be vulnerable. Is to be weak. And so we think that we have to act like we have everything together when we're around other people. This is such a church thing. We we think that we can't be vulnerable around other people. But I think vulnerability is the doorway to a deeper intimacy with God. Do you want to know the truth of who you are? Read God's Word. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. And it doesn't matter how much someone hollers. It doesn't matter what they say. Because when you have the truth, you can stand on it. Let's see how Jesus responds to the accusations that they give. Verse 23 And he called them to him. They were over there talking. And he calls them over, he says, to them. And he said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed, he may plunder his house. Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of man. Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of man. And whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. In response, Jesus tells them parables. Warren Wiersbe is an American author and uh, and a pastor. He says this about parables, and, and I really like the way that he puts it. It says, a parable begins innocently as a picture that arrests our attention and arouses our interest. But as we study the picture, it becomes a mirror in which we suddenly see ourselves. If we continue to look by faith, the mirror becomes a window through which we see God and his truth. How we respond to that truth will determine what further truth God will teach us. We can see three different responses in this passage from Jesus as he responds to their accusations. The first one is this. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Jesus responds to the second accusation first, that he drives out demons by the prince of demons. Jesus says, look, 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 if I'm casting out demons by the power of Satan, then Satan is fighting against himself. 
It's like a military unit firing on themselves instead of the enemy. For you Canadians, it's like a hockey player who has a breakaway towards an empty net and the teammate skates up beside him, steals the puck and clears it down to the other end of the ice. It doesn't make any sense. You don't do that. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying to them, what you're accusing me of makes no sense. How can Satan drive out Satan? You see, the mission of Satan was to control men, and he used demons to do so. The mission of Satan was not to free men from demons. And so Jesus points out that if Satan is at war with himself, then the only possible outcome is the collapse of his kingdom. You know, I think we can understand in today's day what a divided house is and what it looks like, right? I mean, when we look across the landscape of this world, there are houses divided politically in every nation. Everyone is fighting against everyone, and no one is winning. There are houses divided relationally between brothers and sisters and moms and dads and families are being torn apart. And the enemy is enjoying every moment. And there are, there are houses divided spiritually. There are very few churches any longer who have not tasted division. There are very few people who go, there are church members who have not experienced some kind of relational division within the church as well. Jesus is telling them, and he's telling us this morning as well, a house divided cannot stand. But a house united, that's a house to be reckoned with. The second response from Jesus is this. There is a man stronger than the strong man of this world. Look again at verse 27. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Imagine with me a strong man, a well-built man. I thought of Josh. He's my hero. A well-built man, okay? But it could be anyone in, in any way. A man who is well-armed to protect what he loves. A man who will die to keep his house safe. That doesn't necessarily only include Josh. I have a bat waiting for anyone who wants to break into my house. In the name of Jesus. If you're going to rob that man, if you're going to go in and take what's his, you're not just going to walk in and start robbing him while he stands beside and watches. No, you're going to have to overpower him. You're going to have to tie him up, and you're going to have to tie him up really, really good. Because only when he is subdued and bound can you consider robbing his house. And if you're going to overpower him, then you have to be stronger than he is. In this parable, Satan is the strong man. And look this morning, make no mistake, he is powerful. He is powerful, and you and I cannot just walk into his kingdom and start plundering. And so Jesus says to them, he says, he's telling these teachers of the law, he says, look, I can't rob Satan in his own house, in his own kingdom, without overpowering him, tying him up first. I can't plunder the strong man unless I'm stronger than the strong man. That's so cool. It's so cool. Jesus isn't possessed by Satan like they're accusing him of being. He isn't controlled by Satan. Satan is controlled and overpowered by Jesus. Jesus, Satan is the strong man, but Jesus is the stronger man. And that's why Philippians 4.13 is so powerful for our lives. Paul writes these words we all know so well. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. He's the strong man. That's why Isaiah 40.31 is so meaningful. But they will wait for the Lord. They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with, with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That's why the Psalms are... A place of encouragement, Psalm 46, 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Jesus is our strength. 
And we live in the home of the strong man. The place where he lives, this world. But Jesus is stronger. And that means that you and I can have strength because of Jesus who lives within us. To fight the enemy. He first responds by telling them a house divided against itself will fall. He tells them the only way he can do the things he's doing is because he's stronger than the enemy. And thirdly, Jesus responds to their accusations by saying this. God is gracious to offer forgiveness to everyone who will receive it. Look at verses 28 and 29 again. Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man. And whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. Here's the good news for us this morning. God loves his creation. And he seeks to redeem it and forgive it. He is willing to forgive our sin. He is willing to forgive our rebellion. To forgive us no matter how terrible or how vile or how wicked we are. We are all able to find forgiveness at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. All we have to do is turn away from our sin and turn to Jesus as our Lord and Savior. 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Romans 10.9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Does it shock you? Maybe surprise you that Jesus is willing to forgive you of your sins? It's a wonderful thing. But Jesus tells the scribes, it's true. It's true. All of your sins can be forgiven. And then there's a but. And this particular one has caused confusion among many Christians. Jesus says, but blasphemy against the Spirit is an eternal sin that cannot be forgiven. I think what's confusing here is so often you've, you're reading the scripture and what Jesus just said was all blasphemies will be forgiven. And then he says this. So what is he talking about? As you search through scripture, bl blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is only mentioned here and in the parallel accounts in Matthew and Luke. And so what's happening here? That's the context we find ourselves in. The scribes have attributed the work of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' life to Satan. They have sinfully rejected the Holy Spirit and his work. Think about it for a minute. The Holy Spirit who is pure and holy, if he is thought to be de a demonic spirit, to be an evil spirit, and if Jesus is thought to be a demonic being, then someone who believes such things cannot possibly believe that Jesus is the Savior. You cannot believe it. What that looks like for you and for me this morning is a resistance to the Holy Spirit. It's a rejection of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a rejection to his invitation to believe and receive salvation. So what's this unforgivable sin that Jesus is talking about here? The answer seems to me to be to be convicted by the Holy Spirit concerning Jesus. To hear the message of the gospel. To be convicted and to repent of your sin and believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. And to finally receive and experience forgiveness and hope and new life. And an eternal relationship with Jesus Christ. To decline that invitation. To reject God's marvelous grace. To reject the gospel. And to continuously do so all the way to the grave. That is the only thing that cannot be forgiven. That person will find themselves eternally separated from God without hope and without life and without love. John the Baptist, in talking to his own disciples, said this, John 3, 36. Whoever believes in the Son of Man has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son of Man shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains 
on him. So as we close this morning, where do you stand with Jesus? Where do you stand? In the same account in the book of Matthew, Matthew 12, 30, Jesus says this, whoever is not with me is against me. That means this morning that you can either choose as the scribes did, you can choose the man, the strong man in his kingdom, or you can choose the stronger man. And you can receive forgiveness no matter what you have done. Maybe this morning that's what you need to do. Maybe you're here this morning, though, and you've made the choice to surrender your life to Jesus already. But maybe you needed to be reminded that his strength is more than enough for you. He is already victorious over the enemy. And you can find strength and joy and purpose and hope in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you that, Father, as we see, as we live in this world and we experience the things we experience, and we, we feel defeated often. People are coming at us in every direction. We're thankful and grateful, Father, that you, you sent your son, Jesus, and he experienced the same things we did. But more than that, Father, we are thankful that he went to the cross for our sins. If we would just believe and call on the name of Jesus and repent of the things, Father, the sins in our lives that separate us from you, you will save us. You will give us eternal life. And because Jesus is stronger than the strong man of this world, we can be victorious over the sin and the things that bond us Keep us in bondage in our lives. And so, Father, this morning, it's my prayer that if there is someone here this morning who hasn't made their mind up yet, that your spirit would speak to them and say, you know what, in a way, you already have made up your mind. You have chosen to reject the things of the Lord. The truth of who Jesus is the truth of who God has called you to be. And you've chosen the strong man. And Father, I pray this morning that someone would say, oh, I didn't know I was doing that. Or I want to be freed from the sin of my life. I want to have Jesus as my Savior. And they would surrender their lives, Father, to you today and today they will make the choice and father if there are those here this morning who would say you know i've just kind of been doing life i haven't really thought much of jesus i pray this morning that your word would speak very clearly that you desire to have their lives all of it and that you will do more things in and through them than they could ever imagine. That the enemy just wants us to be distracted. And he'll use good things to distract us. But when we're distracted in this world, we're going to miss out on Jesus. We're going to miss out on our neighbors who need Jesus. We're going to miss out on opportunities to live the kingdom life that you have for us. And so, God, today I pray that you would speak in a way that you haven't spoken to us in a while. You would say, I love you. The proof is I sent my son to die for you. I want your life. I want to use you in ways that you could never imagine. Just surrender. So, Father, I pray today that we will respond to you in the way that we need to respond. This morning, as we get ready to stand and sing again, that it wouldn't just be a song right before we leave church to feel good about, hey, we went to church today. But this morning, it would be different. Maybe today we'll have a hard time singing because you're speaking so clearly. Maybe we'll need to go talk to someone. 
Maybe we need to grab someone next to us and ask them to pray for us. Father, we don't have to put on a show in your kingdom. We don't have to pretend like everything's all together. But we know the one who holds it together. So, Father, would you do that this morning? Would you speak as only you can speak? Father, we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen.